Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Charts with Dan. We have a lot to get to this week. I apologize if I look or sound a little more tired than usual. Sometimes part of doing your own thing means that your schedule gets completely turned on its head, and so I'm actually filming this in the very early hours of the morning uh, before I post it online. So if I miss a couple things, uh, I do apologize. But I did prepare the show just as much as I always do. That's one of the reasons why I'm filming so late, so hopefully you won't notice a difference. Before we get to any of the box office stuff, I want to thank, as always, my partner here on the show, Carbon Health. You can download the Carbon Health app right now to see if there is a location near you. If you're in California or Massachusetts, you can use Carbon Health as your primary care provider. Or if there's not a location near you, you can still use Carbon Health for telehealth and virtual care for people that can't make it in to an actual physical location. Carbon Health also does things like flu shots, as we are still in the midst of a pretty nasty cold and flu season and so much more. I'm so happy to be partnered with Carbon Health because I like their mission, which is to make healthcare as available as possible, as affordably as possible to as many people as possible. So thank you as always to Carbon Health for being my partner here on the show. And let's look at the box office for this past weekend. I feel like it was a little novella at the box office because there were so many little stories that we're going to get into. First and foremost, of course, the continued success of Avatar The Way of Water in its seventh week, a 20.7% drop, staying on top of the box office for a seventh consecutive week. The first movie to do that since the original Avatar back in 2009. $15.9 million in week seven. Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, another incredible hold. 11.1% drop in its sixth week of release, a $10.4 million total. It actually moves up one spot to take second place. In third place is Pathan, which is a movie we're going to talk about at length in just a few minutes. It is a huge release out of India that did well not just here in the United States, but also, of course, around the world. $6.8 million in third place for that debut. A Man Called Auto continuing to hold well, a 24.4% drop in week five and a $6.6 million total. Megan, for a horror film, really continuing to do well, a 35.5% drop in week four with an $8.8 million total. Missing, which debuted last week, has a pretty good hold, a 38% drop in its second week and a $5.6 million total. Plane is in seventh place in its third week, a 27.7% drop and a $3.8 million total. The Wandering Earth 2, which I originally had had slotted to start playing the previous weekend when it started playing in China, reported grosses finally for this past weekend, just over $3 million in limited release, left behind Rise of the Antichrist, not in limited release, actually in wide release, comes in ninth place with $2.5 million. And then Infinity Pool, the latest from Brandon Cronenberg, which had a big debut at Sundance, followed by a debut in theaters around the country, comes in 10th place with $2.5 million total. When we have a lot of new movies, that means a lot of older ones drop out of the top 10, and the oldest one was Black Panther Wakanda Forever. After 11 weeks in the top 10, it is now out, even as Angela Bassett picked up the expected Academy Award nomination for the film. It was the first Oscar nomination for any performer in a Marvel Cinematic Universe film. The Whale drops out of the top 10 after five weeks following Brendan Fraser's nomination for Best Actor. House Party drops out of the top 10 after just two weeks, and that time I got reincarnated as a slime, the movie Scarlet Bond spends just one week in the top 10 before making way for other films. When we look at the road to recovery, which is basically how the box office is doing after we get past the cinema closures due to the pandemic, the red line there you see is the average from 2021 to 2022 after theaters started to reopen. The blue line is the average from 2015 to 2019 pre-pandemic, and that dotted black line is this year, and you see that we continue to plot a course, a very snake-like course, basically between those two numbers, an improvement on the last couple of years, but still a marked decrease from where we were pre-pandemic. And I added a little poster there you see just over week seven. That is Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, which is where we should see a pretty big spike at the box office, certainly bigger than that red spike that we see there from the last couple of years. So this will be very interesting to watch to see just how Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania does in just a couple of short weeks. We're coming up on it pretty quickly. So I mentioned that Pathan was a top five movie here in the United States, or I should say in the domestic market in the United States and Canada. That was the third best debut ever for a film out of India in the domestic market, at least as far as I could find with my records. Bahubali 2, the conclusion 
Illusion back in 2017 still holds the top opener for a film out of India with $10.4 million, followed by RRR, which sadly only picked up one Academy Award nomination, but still an extremely popular film globally. It opened to $9.5 million last March. And then you can see the rest of the top five, all movies that opened subsequent to RRR. So we're really seeing a huge increase in popularity in Indian cinema here domestically. Pathan is at number three with $6.8 million, followed by Brahmastra Part 1 Shiva, which opened last September with $4.5 million, and Pony and Selvan Part 1, which also opened last September here domestically with just over $4 million. And Pathan was a huge hit globally. It is the fourth part of what is called the YRF Spy Universe, or Yashraj Films. It also featured the return of Shah Rukh Khan, or SRK, who is the lead of the film, the first time he's been the lead of the film in a few years. It is the fastest grossing Indian film of all time, meaning that it is hitting these different financial milestones quicker than any other film ever released in India. The Hindi version passed the 300 crore Mark. Crore is a way of measuring currency in India. It's very difficult to, to parse. I had to do a lot of research when I was looking at this, but it's the fastest that any movie in India has ever passed that mark, and that's just one version of the film. It's, of course, dubbed into other languages in India and around the world. Overall, Pathan is now the 14th highest grossing Indian film of all time worldwide, and we'll look at what its total is later. And that's after just less than a week in release. So this is a huge deal as far as Indian cinema goes, and we're seeing it spreading around the globe. It's even playing here locally. We actually get several Indian films here locally, and I'm hoping to maybe get a chance to catch Pathan before it moves out of theaters, because we usually don't get them for very very long. So I'm hoping that maybe its success here means that I'll have a little bit of an extra window. I also wanted to talk a little bit more about Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, which continues to show some great box office longevity. In fact, even though we are almost into February, it has taken a record for the box office year of 2022 as far as movies opening in 2022. We talked about this last week that it was close to doing it, and it is now the leggiest movie released in 2022. It has now earned 11.32 times its opening weekend, which displaces everything everywhere all at once, which had earned 11.2 times its opening weekend in wide release. Top Gun Maverick is still number three, where the Crawdads Sing is still number four, and Elvis is still number five, although Avatar The Way of Water is very close to cracking that top five. But Puss in Boots The Last Wish really hanging around and showing some great box office legs. It just picked up that nomination for Best Animated Feature Film, and I know that a lot of people are saying like, oh, well, Guillermo del Toro Pinocchio is probably going to win, and I'd say it's the odds-on favorite, but there is a lot of support for Puss in Boots' The Last Wish, and if there's a big push as Oscar voting closes, I could see it getting it done. If, if it were to win, I'll say this, I would not be shocked. Of course, we also have our required Avatar versus Avatar The Way of Water update to see just where we think or where I think the final domestic gross for Avatar The Way of Water is going to land. And I still believe that it is going to fall short of the domestic mark of the original film, especially when you look at this chart. This is the cumulative daily box office for both Avatar, which is in blue, and Avatar The Way of Water, which is in orange. You see that the gap was really pretty pronounced about three weeks into the release cycle, but look at how much that gap is closing. I think within seven to 10 days, those lines are going to intersect and Avatar will begin outgrossing Avatar The Way of Water at that point in its release cycle. The sequel's just not quite having the same incredible longevity, which by the way, maybe one or two movies ever released have had the same kind of longevity as Avatar. But these are two lines that I expected to intersect that I think are going to intersect. And really one reason why is when you look at the daily box office adjustment adjusted for inflation and you see that widening gap between Avatar and Avatar The Way of Water when you adjust those grosses you see that gap exploding now and it's just incredible the rocket fuel that the original Avatar had and the amazing box office run that it had. There's no shame in not being able to replicate that box office feat. When we look at the 2022 domestic box office, Avatar The Way of Water has closed the gap even more on Top Gun Maverick. It's now less than $100 million behind Top Gun Maverick's domestic box office gross. So the question now is, does it have about $98 million more domestically left in the tank to become the highest grossing film 
film of 2022. I've said that I don't think that it will be, that I think it's going to be close. And when we look at Top Gun Maverick versus Avatar at their daily box office, the reason why, again, look at the Top Gun Maverick line there in red, it is narrowing that gap. And I expect maybe this week, maybe not, that that red line, again, is going to intersect the blue line and that Avatar The Way of Water is going to fall just short of Top Gun Maverick when we talk about domestic grosses for movies released in 2022. The Way of Water actually just beat out Top Gun Maverick when we look at the highest grossing seventh weekends in wide release by a little under half a million dollars. But I expect Top Gun Maverick to start winning those competitions, winning the daily box office competitions. Which, by the way, it's not a competition. These, these two movies aren't enemies. It's kind of like a horse race, but it doesn't really matter who wins because both horses are just going to get put out to stud. It really does not matter. It's just something that I like to track and that I like to follow because I think that it's fun and I think that it's interesting to see how different movies perform under different circumstances. They're both, I think, really good movies. I like Top Gun Maverick a little bit more, but they're also both very, very successful movies. And at this point, it's really just about the details. And that's part of what the show is about. So the last couple weeks, I've been showing you some facts and figures about how much potential profit Avatar The Way of Water could be making, but I have a little bit of a mea culpa here because I've been giving you some slightly bad information, and it was an oversight on my part that I actually didn't catch until this week. I'm surprised that uh, you folks at home, just very eagle-eyed viewers, didn't catch it either, but I've been breaking down the gross of Avatar The Way of Water based on different regions, and I've been giving you the gross that the movie made in China and then the gross that the movie made internationally because it's a different share of those grosses that go back to the studio. Well, what I wasn't doing was subtracting the Chinese gross from the international gross. So that essentially was counting the money that Avatar was making in China towards its box office twice. And that's over $200 million, which is a pretty substantial figure. And I was going over stuff this week and I caught it. Uh, and so when you look at these numbers, and I'll go over it again, they are a about the same as where they were last week, and that's because of user error here. And I've always said, I endeavor not to make mistakes, but when I do make mistakes, I want to own up to them, and I want to be accountable for them, and I want to point them out because I want to be putting good information out there. So let's look at the breakdown in the more conservative estimates here with a bit of a higher budget, a bit of a higher advertising budget as well, and a bit less money going to the studio than may actually be going to the studio. So a 20% share of the Chinese growth going to the studio, that's a cut of about $48.3 million. A 40% share of the international gross going to the studio, that revised number is just over $1.2 billion with about half a billion dollars going to the studio. A 60% share of domestic week one, which comes out to about $118.6 million. A 55% share of domestic week two, which comes out to about $88.2 million. And a 50% share of the domestic gross from week three on, which comes out to about $131.3 million. When you add it all up, it's about $888.2 million of money coming back to the studio after the cut is taken out by exhibition with the costs again on the more aggressive side at about $650 million. That puts Avatar The Way of Water's profit right now at about $238.2 million under less ideal circumstances. But let's get a little bit more aggressive given the best case scenario numbers. And I think that the answer really lies somewhere between these two figures. A 20% share of China and a 40% share internationally stays the same, but this is assuming a 65% share of the domestic gross. I mentioned last week I got some insider information from somebody who's in the exhibition industry who said that at least for traditional exhibition, meaning non-IMAX, etc., that the studio was getting 65% of the gross flat out. So this is kind of assuming that that 65% share also applies to IMAX and all other ways of showing the film domestically. A 65% share of what the movie's made so far is just over $400 million. And then I cut the budget and the advertising down a little bit as well. So that adds up to income around $953.6 million, costs at about $550 million for a profit of just over $400 million. So by my estimates, that leaves about $250 to $400 million of profit so far after paying back costs and all of the expense to make the movie, etc., to give out to James Cameron and to go back to the studio and the shareholders etc. Uh, there's no exact science because we're never going to get exact numbers. Nobody in Hollywood ever gets exact numbers that they think that they can reliably trust about how much money comes back in from a movie, but that's my best guess.
Before we move on, I want to thank one of our sponsors this week. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. The beginning of a new year is often about finding that best version of yourself, but it's easy to lose track of how to do that. I know the day-to-day -day of running this channel means that I sometimes lose focus on myself and what's best for my own well-being and who I want to be. Therapy is something I've been interested in trying for a while now, and that's why I was happy when BetterHelp came on board as a sponsor for the channel. I jumped at the chance to start using the service Service, and I've already had a great session with a therapist that was recommended based specifically on my goals and needs. Mental health is something that many people aren't comfortable talking about publicly, but it is so important. It's not just for people that are going through a difficult or a traumatic time. I found that everyday stress can add up, and BetterHelp has already been useful to talk about some of that with a professional. BetterHelp is entirely online, flexible to your schedule, and convenient. After filling out a brief questionnaire, you'll be matched with a licensed therapist. And if you'd like to switch therapists, you can do so at any time free of charge. If you want to live a more empowered life, therapy can get you there. Visit BetterHelp.com slash Merle today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash Merle. Finally, I wanted to take a look at the convoluted history behind an unlikely franchise that was in the top 10 this week. Left Behind Rise of the Antichrist was at number nine with a $2.5 million total. And that franchise is actually a little bit more complicated than you might realize. It's based on a series of 16 books that were published between 1995 to 2007 about the end of the world from a Christian perspective. Back in the year 2000, Kirk Cameron starred in the first adaptation of the first book in the series, which was called Left Behind, that went to video first and then to theaters. A sequel to that movie, Tribulation Force, went straight to video in 2002. That began the adaptation of the second book in the Left Behind series. And then a third movie, World at War, was released straight to video in 2005 that finished adapting that second book. Then in 2014, the series was rebooted, starring Nicolas Cage with a much bigger budget, reportedly around $16 million. So they started back over doing the first book again, but that movie made less than $30 million worldwide. It was unlikely that it turned a profit. It was part of the infamous 0% club on Rotten Tomatoes. This movie is a continuation of the rebooted Left Behind series with Kevin Sorbo replacing Nick Cage as the series protagonist, whose name, by the way, is Rayford Steele. Kevin Sorbo also directed this Left Behind movie. So what we're really seeing is a recast sequel to a reboot of an adaptation. And you thought Fast and the Furious was complicated. Let's look at some other charts covering this past weekend at the box office, starting with the per theater average, the top five. At number one is The Wandering Earth 2. It was only released in 142 theaters, but brought in $21,000 per theater, so that's good enough for the best average of the weekend. At number two is Close, which was the submission by Belgium to the Academy Awards for the Best International Feature Race. It was nominated for Best International Feature, so good timing on that limited release. Just four theaters, but $17,000 per theater. Pathan played 695 theaters, but it looked like it was a very strategically safe rollout, even though it was in limited release. It brought in $9,902 per theater. Avatar The Way of Water at number four. It is now under 4,000 theaters. It's in about 3,600 theaters. It made over $4,000 per theater. And then at number five is a movie called One Fine Morning. It made just over $4,300 in three theaters. It is the latest film from director Mia Hansen Love starring Leia Sadu. The top five films in limited release, meaning 1,000 theaters or fewer, were Pathan with $6.8 million total in 695 theaters, The Wandering Earth 2 with just over $3 million in 142 theaters, Billie Eilish live at the O2, the extended cut. This was a one night only event playing in just under 600 theaters. It featured never before seen footage of live performances that were filmed in London. It brought in just under $1.3 million in that one night only event. Fear, which was the latest film from director Dion Taylor, put up a $1.2 million opening just under that wide release threshold, 974 theaters. I put a 2023 next to Fear's title, by the way, because I still do have perfect recall of Mark Wahlberg's mid-90s filmography. And at number five, after a couple of high-profile Oscar nominations, including Best Picture, Women Talking continues its expansion, now in over 700 theaters in its sixth week of release, for a total of $970,000. 
$1,000. Looking at the highest grossers in limited release this calendar year, so it doesn't matter when a movie was released as long as a ticket was sold after January 1st, Pathan is now the highest grossing film in limited release this year with $9.4 million. It knocks A Man Called Auto, the amount of money it made in limited release this year, down to number two. Same with The Whale, knocked down to number three. The Wandering Earth 2 debuts on the chart at number four. Walter Viraya, and I still cannot find confirmation for this $2.25 million total, but I'm going to stick with it until I can find concrete information that contradicts it. Currently at number five, Women Talking drops down one spot to number six at $2.2 million, followed by Skinamarink at number seven with $1.8 million. That drops three spots. Billie Eilish Live at the O2 debuts on the chart at number eight. Fear debuts on the chart at number nine. Broker drops four spots to number 10. And then we lose The Devil Conspiracy, Corsage, The Banshees of Inna Sharon again, the second time it's fallen off this chart this year, and Living, despite some big Oscar nominations for both Banshees and Living last week. When we look at the 2023 domestic winter spring box office, which is basically all movies released in calendar year 2023, Megan still is the highest grossing film released in 2023 domestically. There has been a little bit of, not controversy, but some curiosity because it was actually released internationally a couple of days before New Year's. So some people saying like, well, it's a 2022 release. Some outlets are considering it for worldwide box office a 2022 release i'm going by domestic release date just to kind of keep it in the conversation and it's definitely a 2023 release domestically but i'm also listing it worldwide for 2023 even though technically it was in some markets in the later days of 2022 sometimes these things just pop up and you have to make a judgment call that's the way that i'm going but no controversy about megan being released in 2023 here in the domestic market and it's the number one grocer of the year 82.1 million dollars playing is at number two. Missing is at number three. Pathan debuts on the chart at number four. House Party drops down one spot to number five. Left Behind, The Rise of the Antichrist debuts at number six. The Wandering Earth 2 debuts at number seven. Infinity Pool debuts at number eight. Walter Viraya drops down four spots to number nine. Skin Marink drops four spots to number ten. And then that time I got reincarnated as a slime, The Devil Conspiracy, Sheen Ultraman, and The Sun all drop out of the 2023 domestic winter spring box office. When we look at this year's box office by calendar gross, meaning all tickets sold after January 1st, no matter when the movie was released, Avatar The Way of Water sold the most tickets this year, $219.8 million, followed by Puss in Boots The Last Wish. It overtakes Megan to become the second highest grossing calendar film of the year at $85 million. Megan is at number three, followed by A Man Called Auto and Plane. Missing rises two spots to number six. Black Panther Recon to Forever drops one spot to number seven. Pathan debuts at number eight, which drops I Want to Dance with Somebody down two spots to number nine, and The Whale to number 10. House Party drops off the 2023 domestic box office chart altogether. Let's take a look now outside of the domestic box office around the world to the international box office where we are still seeing the later part. This past weekend was the last part of the Chinese New Year box office window. So we have an international scene that's largely dominated by Chinese films. Full River Red takes over from The Wandering Earth 2 and was the dominant film over this Chinese New Year season. $144.3 million last weekend. The Wandering Earth 2, though, brings in $104.8 million from this past weekend. Pathan, as I mentioned, a big international debut, $47.8 million so far. Boonie Bear's Guardian Code at $43.7 million, and Avatar The Way of Water hanging in there at number five with $42.4 million. When you take those international numbers, you combine them with the domestic numbers, we get our top five films worldwide. And Full River Red stays at number one with $144.3 million. The Wandering Earth 2 adds a little bit to its total because we have domestic numbers now, $170. $7.8 million. Avatar The Way of Water climbs up to number three with that domestic total added in at $58.3 million. Pathan is at number four with $54.7 million. And Boonie Bear's Guardian Code is at number five with $43.7 million. So I'm going to show you a worldwide box office chart for 2023 with the caveat that it is incredibly difficult to find reliable information across several different sources about just how much money specific movies have made right now. This is going to take a little bit of time to settle. So some of these movies, you may see grosses that are higher or lower than are listed here. This is really based off of me looking at about 12 different places and making a judgment call as to how much movies have made and where they are on this chart. 
At number one is Full River Red, which has reportedly banked about half a billion dollars so far, $466 million. The Wandering Earth 2 with a very impressive $377 million gross thus far. Megan is at number three. It's made nearly $150 million worldwide, which for the budget it was made on is incredible. Boonie Bear's Guardian Code at number four. Hidden Blade is at number five. Cheburashka, which is a Russian family film, has reportedly earned $75.7 million, which means that I have put it on the chart, but I stand by my choices as far as the graphics on that chart. That's not an oversight. Pathan is at number seven with $67.6 million. Deep Sea and 500 Miles, two more films from China, are at numbers eight and nine. And Plane is bringing up the rear, $30.1 million globally for the number 10 slot. And as big as the Chinese grosses and Pathan were, when we look at the worldwide box office this weekend, the big story still was Avatar The Way of Water because it jumped two huge movies to become the fourth highest grossing film of all time globally. Let's look at that chart right now. At number one is still the original Avatar with $2.9 billion. Avengers Endgame right behind at number two. Titanic at number three. And now we have Avatar The Way of Water at number four with $2.1 117 billion dollars that means that james cameron has now directed three of the four highest grossing films of all time globally which is an incredible feat star wars the force awakens is bumped down one spot to number five avengers infinity war drops down one spot to number six and then we have spider-man no way home jurassic world the lion king and the avengers so now the big question is a, can Avatar The Way of Water pass Titanic to become the third highest grossing film of all time? And B, how much is Titanic going to make in its re-release later this year? And will it reclaim that spot at number three if it loses it to Avatar The Way of Water? We just don't know yet. But again, this movie just keeps going. It looks like $2.2 billion is probably guaranteed. We'll see if it gets to $2.3 billion after that. But again, yet another phenomenal global box office run for James Cameron. Many people expected less, but he's showing us time and time again that we should expect no less from him. So this is the point in the show where I like to take a look at a weekend from box office history, but also acknowledge some figures that have passed away in the entertainment industry, particularly impacting movies and TV. And there were a trio of actresses that had an impact multi-generationally that I wanted to acknowledge this week. The first is Cindy Williams, who was a BAFTA nominee for Best Supporting Actress for her role in George Lucas's breakout film, American Graffiti. She also had a role in Francis Ford Coppola's The Conversation, part of a goat run for him as a director. But Cindy Williams was probably most famous for playing Shirley alongside Penny Marshall as Laverne in the hit TV show Laverne and Shirley, which was a spinoff of Happy Days. Laverne and Shirley was a top five TV show for its first four seasons, bringing in over 30 million viewers a week. Cindy Williams would go on to guest star on over a dozen TV shows in the years since. Also passing away this past week was Lisa Loring from 1964 to 1966. Lisa Loring played Wednesday Adams on the ABC TV show The Adams Family. While only 64 episodes of The Adams Family were made, it stayed in the zeitgeist long enough to spawn a hit film in 1991. And then, of course, Netflix's Wednesday, which is one of the most successful shows in the streamer's history. Jenna Ortega specifically choreographed a brief nod to Lisa Loring in her choreography for Wednesday's now famous dance scene. And finally, an actress who had an impact on so many different fandoms across so many different forms of media, Annie Wershing. She was the Borg Queen in season two of Star Trek Picard, which wasn't my favorite season, but I thought that she was good in it. She was also a regular on the series Bosch, a regular on the series The Runaways, as well as Timeless and The Vampire Diaries. She voiced the role of Tess in The Last of Us, which is a role taken over by Anna Torv in the current HBO Max series. And my first introduction to her was as Renee Walker in the hit Fox TV show 24. She played that role across several seasons opposite Kiefer Sutherland. It really has been interesting to see the outpouring of love uh, for Annie Wershing over this last few days because she meant so much to so many different people because she was so versatile and was in so many different shows and movies and video games, etc. It's rare to see somebody who's had such a seismic impact on so many different people, along with Cindy Williams and Lisa Loring, all of them leaving a huge legacy behind, future past and present. And as always, my thoughts go out to their friends, family, and fans.
Let's look now at a weekend from box office history, and we are going back 25 years to January 23rd to the 25th, 1998, the fourth weekend of the year, which saw Titanic continuing its phenomenal box office run, $25.2 million in its sixth week of release, just a 15.9% drop from the previous weekend. Not so close at number two was Spice World, starring the Spice Girls. Yep, we're in 1998, and that's just what the world was back then. $10.5 million in second place. Wouldn't it have been hilarious if Spice World was the movie that took down Titanic at number one, but it didn't even come close. Goodwill Hunting, as Academy Awards season started ramping up, in its eighth week of release saw a 28% drop and an $8.5 million total. It would go on to win the Academy Award for Best Original Screenplay, as well as Best Support actor for Robin Williams. As good as it gets in its fifth week had a drop of less than 10% on its way to Academy Awards for both Jack Nicholson and Helen Hunt, a $7.5 million total. And in its second week, Denzel Washington and John Goodman in Fallen rounded out the top five with $4.9 million, just a 46% drop. Fallen is a movie that I think has found an audience after the theaters. I've heard a lot of people that still reference Fallen as one of their favorite thrillers. Another movie that I wanted to acknowledge, though, that opened in ninth place that weekend was the film Phantoms, which made just over $3 million. And the reason that I mention it is that Matt Damon may have been Oscar nominated for Goodwill Hunting, but we all know that Ben Affleck was the bomb in Phantoms. And it opened in ninth place, which meant that Affleck had two movies in the top 10 that week. So who's the real winner there? Of course, as I always do, I like to run these historical weekends through the inflation filter to see what those totals would have looked like in today's dollars. So let's hit the inflation button on this flashback weekend, and you'll see that Titanic has an adjusted total of $45.3 million in week six. Most movies nowadays, if you're not a Marvel film, would love to open at $45.3 million. Spice World with an $18.9 million total, followed by Goodwill Hunting with $15.2 million, as good as it gets with $13.5 million, Fallen at $8.8 million, and as I mentioned in ninth place, Phantoms, with an adjusted opening of $5.5 million. Before we move on, I'm going to thank the sponsor for today's show, AG1 by Athletic Greens. We are well into January, which means it is time to buckle down and really think about making better choices. And AG1 is an easy and delicious choice when it comes to giving your body what it needs. So what is AG1? Well, with one delicious scoop, you're absorbing 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced superfoods, and more to help you start your day right. And it is super simple. I can either put a scoop right into a cup of water, or if I'm feeling adventurous, mix it into a shake for breakfast at home. Either way, it's a quick and tasty way for me to start the day off right and make sure that I'm supporting not only my gut health, but my immune system, my recovery, focus, and so much more. If you don't take a multivitamin or you've been trying to figure out which one to take, AG1 is a great choice because because it's full of high quality ingredients that your body will actually absorb. So right now it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. And to make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash Dan. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash Dan, D-A-N, to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. And I want to thank AG1 by Athletic Greens for sponsoring today's show. Before we wrap up, let's look as we always do at the streaming charts to see what people are watching at home through the various different streaming services. And we will start with the iTunes store. And at number one is Megan, which is still in the top five of the box office, but also available now for purchase and premium video on demand, which are those higher price rentals. Good enough for number one on the chart. So it's bringing in money across several different revenue streams. Triangle of Sadness is at number two, perhaps because of its surprise nominations for best director and best picture. Puss in Boots The Last Wish is at number three, another movie doing incredibly well in theaters and also on the home market. This is a great hybrid performance for this film. Ticket to Paradise is at number four. Tar is at number five. The Banshees of Inna Sharon returns to the chart, available for rental, perhaps boosted by its Oscar nominations. Devotion is at number seven. Everything Everywhere All at Once returns to the chart. The Oscar leader, 11 nominations at the Academy Awards, so I think some people checking out that movie. Lyle Lyle Crocodile returns to the chart at number nine, and The Menu stays on the chart at number 10. 
Let's look at the most watched programs on Netflix. This is the Netflix chart for the week of January 16th through the 22nd. At number one is the Netflix movie Dog Gone, which as I mentioned last week is about a dog that's gone. It had a PFV of 13.23, meaning that 13.23 million Netflix users could potentially have finished viewing Dog Gone. So Rob Lowe, back on top of the world. At number two is Jung E, which is the latest Netflix showcase for South Korean talent, a PFV of 11.7. That 90 show, season one, debuts at number three on this chart with a PFV of 10.59, so a healthy number of people finishing the entire first season, and that's just over the first three or four days of release. Jenny and Georgia season two is at number four. Vikings Valhalla season two is at number five. Wednesday season one stays on the chart at number six, a PFV of seven. The Pale Blue Eye is at number seven with a PFV of 5.88. The hatchet wielding hitchhiker spends the second week on the chart at number eight with a PFV of 5.84. Glass Onion remains on the chart with a PFV of 5.21. And Ginny and Georgia season one rounds out the top 10 with a PFV of 4.63. Looking at the 10 most watched Netflix programs released in 2022, even if those viewership numbers bleed over into 2023, you'll see that Glass Onion has now broken into the top five with a PFE of 123.5, and it will soon pass the Gray Man for number four on the list. So Glass Onion becoming one of the most popular Netflix movie or TV shows for the entire year, as expected, considering they've shelled out about a quarter of a billion dollars for two movies there. Purple Hearts drops down there to number six. Everything else stays the same as Wednesday season one continues to run up the score as the most watched program of 2022 on Netflix. And when we look at the most watched Netflix programs from June 2021 to present, June 2021 is when they started providing these numbers. We see that Glass Onion has jumped up to number eight on that list. Glass Onion should be up to number seven by next week, and we'll see where it goes from there. And then you see Wednesday season one continuing to creep up on Squid Game. I don't know if it's going to catch it, but it's going to get awfully close. A 245.6 PFV to Squid Game's 279.2. Finally, we have the Nielsen ratings, which were not released for streamers last week by the time I did the show, or at least not on their website when I looked at it. Other people said like, no, the ratings came out. I saw them. You may have seen them elsewhere. They certainly were not listed officially on their site. So instead of taking you through two different sets of Nielsen ratings, I just combined two weeks of them. This basically closes us out for 2022 because Nielsen ratings are delayed by about a month. So this covers the window of December 19th, 2022 to January 1st. 2023. And the good news is that from this point on, I can really start keeping track of the hours, etc., to give you a full picture of the Nielsen ratings now that I'll have a full calendar year to actually start tracking them. But let's see what the most watched movies, first of all, were for the last two weeks of 2022. And no surprise, it was Glass Onion, and it wasn't even close. 85.1 million hours watched for Glass Onion for December 19th through January 1st. Strange World on Disney Plus was number two, but with over a 60 million hour difference. So a runaway win for Glass Onion there. Home Alone was at number three. How the Grinch Stole Christmas at number four. Matilda the Musical managing a top five debut. Elf was at number six. Home Alone 2 Lost in New York was at number seven. The Invitation debuting on the chart at number eight. National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation at number nine. One of my favorite Christmas movies. Actually, pretty much all my favorite Christmas movies are on this list. And then at number 10 was The Volcano Rescue from Wakari on Netflix. Looking at the most watched streaming show Shows for December 19th through January 1st. At number one was Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan on Amazon. There were a lot of dads home for the Christmas holidays, and they were all watching Jack Ryan and also Mara because she loves that show. Wednesday was a strong number two. It actually almost still took that title from Jack Ryan despite being out for quite some time. Wednesday is just that popular. Emily in Paris was at number three. The Recruit at number four. Coco Melon at number five. Yellowstone on Peacock at number six. NC at number seven. The Best Man, the final chapters on Peacock, also cracking the top 10. A very rare double Peacock sighting on the streaming ratings. This is a continuation of the film series from Malcolm D. Lee, starring Morris Chestnut, Tay Diggs, Regina Hall, Terrence Howard, Nia Long, and many, many others. So a great cast, a popular film series, and a popular show over that holiday break. Bluey on Disney Plus makes the top 10 with 22.7 million hours watched, and then Friends on HBO Max, 
rounds out that top 10. And finally, when we look at these rankings by watch time per available episode, so how many hours were these series watched given the individual episodes available? Wednesday does top this chart. 7.21 million hours watched per episode for eight available episodes, followed by The Recruit with 5.52 million, The Witcher Blood Origin at number three with 3.8 million, only four episodes of that series. The Best Man the Final Chapters is at number four, so even higher than it was on the regular streaming charts, 3.12 million. Treason at number five with a 2.63 million hours watched per episode with five episodes. Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan still in the top 10 at number six, 2.43 million hours watched per episode, even though it has 24 available episodes. Harry and Megan at number seven with 1.94 million hours watched per episode. Coco Melon at number eight, Emily in Paris at number nine, and Alice in Borderland at number 10. 1.43 1.43 million hours watched per episode for 11 episodes. And that wraps us up for this week. There aren't quite as many options for you this upcoming weekend as there were last weekend, but still some pretty interesting stuff. First of all, tomorrow on Wednesday, Black Panther Wakanda Forever makes its way to Disney+. Plus. So if you didn't catch it in theaters, you can watch it on Disney+, Plus starting tomorrow. Also tomorrow on Wednesday... A theatrical run starts for the newest BTS event. It's called BTS Yet to Come in Cinemas. I really would encourage the people that are in charge of naming these things, especially perhaps in the translation, to add some colons or dashes because that is not the best name or certainly not the name that I would have chosen for this special event. On Thursday, The Chosen, which had a special theatrical event for its first two episodes of Season 3, will have a special theatrical event for its last two episodes of Season 3, and they are really, really teasing the fishes and the loaves, which, to be fair, is like a top five Jesus thing. So The Chosen Season 3 finale theatrical event begins on Thursday. Then on Friday, we have the latest film from M. Night Shyamalan. You can be sure that I will have a review of this on the channel later this week. Knock at the Cabin. Who knows what it's going to be, but it's probably not going to be mediocre. It's going to be great or terrible, and I'm going to love talking about it either way also opening on friday 80 for brady as we get into super bowl season if you want to relive a time when tom brady was actually playing in a super bowl and i have to enjoy these times because they're few and far between the last 20 years or so then you can check out 80 for brady which not only stars wonderful actresses like lily tomlin and jane fonda but also tom brady himself sword art online progressive scurzo of deep night Good grief. It's opening this weekend, so if you're a fan of Sword Art Online, you can check that out. True Spirit is playing on Netflix. It's a sailing movie. It'll be available on Friday. And also on Friday is a film that we've talked about a few times in the limited release charts. Spoiler alert, it will be available on Peacock. They got some pretty good reviews, so maybe I'll be able to check that out soon. And that pretty much does it for us here on Charts with Dan. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to my partners, Carbon Health, and of course, my sponsors this week, Athletic Greens, the makers of AG1, and BetterHelp. You can find information about all of those great sponsors down in the description below. Be sure to stay tuned here this week. Not only am I going to have a review for Knock at the Cabin, I'm also working on a little explainer video for this whole Andrea Riseborough Best Actress nomination thing. I decided to wait and see what happens with the Academy meeting that's supposedly happening today. There's so much floating around about this and what's going on and what happened and what didn't happen where there's some rules broken. I'm researching it. I'm going to do a deep dive video that I plan on putting out later this week as well as, you know, whatever kind of crosses my mind. Who knows? You never really know what's going to pop up here on the channel, except for me. I'm I'm, I'm pretty much a constant. Thanks so much for choosing to spend part of your day here with me. Until next time, stay safe, and I'll see you then. Bye.